What if everything we know about human history is completely wrong? What if 445,000 years ago, Earth wasn't just some quiet planet floating in space, but the target of a high-stakes extraterrestrial operation? You heard that right. I'm talking about the Anunnaki, a group of advanced beings who traveled light years to reach Earth, not to spread peace or enlightenment, but for something far more practical, gold. Why gold? Well, according to ancient Sumerian texts, the oldest written records we've ever found, these beings came from a distant planet, Nibiru, and they were facing a serious environmental crisis. They needed gold, not for jewelry or currency like we use it today, but to repair their planet's atmosphere. That's right, gold, when scattered in fine particles, reflects solar radiation, something we've actually considered in modern times as a solution to climate change. So, these beings weren't just scavengers, they were advanced, and they knew exactly what they needed. Now, let's break this down. These guys land on Earth, right? And they quickly realize that our planet is packed with the stuff they need. Earth's natural resources are rich beyond their wildest expectations. But here's the kicker, they don't want to do the dirty work themselves. The Anunnaki are elite. They see themselves as gods, rulers, not miners. So, what do they do? They set up massive mining operations in places like Southern Africa, especially in a place called the Abzu, an ancient term that some believe refers to these gold-rich regions. And guess who's in charge of this entire operation? Enki, one of the chief Anunnaki leaders. Enki's not just some random alien overlord, he's the mastermind, the engineer behind this entire project. He's got the know-how and the power to organize an interplanetary mission to extract the one resource they desperately need. But mining wasn't easy, even for them. Imagine landing on a planet with no workforce, no infrastructure, and having to dig deep into the Earth to extract the most precious material in the universe. The Anunnaki, as powerful as they were, couldn't handle this alone. They were forced to get their hands dirty, at least at first. As time went on, the Anunnaki grew tired of the constant labor. Mining gold on Earth, with all its challenges, became too much for even them to handle. And this, my friends, is where the story shifts. They were desperate for a solution, and they came up with an idea that would change the course of history forever. They didn't need to work harder, they needed a workforce. And this is the moment where everything changes for humanity. You see, the Anunnaki didn't come here to save us, to guide us toward enlightenment. They came for gold, and when the going got tough, they decided to create us. That's right. According to the ancient Sumerian texts, humanity wasn't some happy accident of evolution. No, we were deliberately created by the Anunnaki to be workers, tools for their gold mining operations. And it wasn't just some basic breeding program. We're talking about high-level, genetic manipulation. Think about it, tens of thousands of years ago, in a world where modern science didn't exist, these beings had the technology to manipulate DNA. Enki, the same Anunnaki leader who was running the show in the gold mines, realized that there were already some primitive hominids living on Earth. Early versions of humans, but not quite like us. They were strong, they could handle the manual labor, but they didn't have the intelligence or capability to do what the Anunnaki needed. So Enki and his sister, Nin Hersag, who was essentially the chief scientist, decided to mix their own DNA with the DNA of these primitive beings. Let me say that again, they combined their genetic material with Earth's native species to create what the Sumerians called the Adamu, the very first human. And this wasn't just some mythological tale. When you look at the Enuma Elish, the Sumerian creation epic, it describes this process with eerie precision. It talks about how the gods bound upon a core of clay the essence of the gods, a poetic way of saying they fused their DNA with a biological template they found on Earth. Now, here's the kicker, this wasn't an overnight process. They didn't just wave their hands and suddenly, humans appeared. The early attempts? Total failures. The ancient texts actually describe how some of the first hybrids were born deformed or incomplete. It took trial and error, but eventually, they got it right. The result was us, Homo sapiens. 
But let's be real here, the Anunnaki didn't create us out of the goodness of their hearts. We were designed for one purpose, to serve them. To mine their gold. To be their labor force. And here's the crazy part, this is where the stories of the Garden of Eden and the creation of Adam and Eve in the Bible may actually originate. Think about it, a being created by the gods, placed in an environment designed for their purpose, then later becoming self-aware. Sound familiar? But back to the science of it all. The idea that an advanced species could manipulate DNA is something we're only now beginning to understand with CISPR technology. Imagine what an advanced race with thousands, if not millions, of years more technological development than us could do. They didn't just tinker with genes, they fundamentally designed us to be what we are. And that brings up all kinds of questions about the origins of our intelligence, our capabilities, and even our spiritual nature. Were these traits engineered into us? Did they give us just enough intelligence to do the work, but not enough to challenge them? Now here's where things get even more interesting. The Anunnaki didn't stop with just creating us as a species. They programmed us to serve, and that mindset has trickled down through history. Look at how ancient civilizations viewed their kings and rulers as gods or intermediaries between the divine and mankind. This obsession with hierarchy, servitude, and the worship of higher powers, it could all trace back to our very first days as the creations of the Anunnaki. We weren't just born into freedom. We were born into servitude, created for a purpose that had nothing to do with our own evolution. And maybe that's why humanity has always been so obsessed with control, domination, and power, because it's written into our very genetic code. From the first cities of Mesopotamia to the empires of today, we've been following the blueprint laid out by our creators. All right, so we've covered how the Anunnaki created humanity through genetic engineering. But here's the thing, they didn't stop there. The real story takes a darker, stranger turn when the Anunnaki begin breeding with their own creations. This isn't just some wild conspiracy theory, we've got clues hidden right there in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Let's dig into this. You've probably heard of the Nephilim, right? Those legendary giants, mentioned in Genesis 6 verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. That's not just poetic language. This verse is telling us something huge, that the sons of God, a term often associated with powerful beings or gods, took human women as partners, creating a race of giants. But what does this have to do with the Anunnaki? Everything. According to ancient Sumerian texts, after the Anunnaki created humanity, some of them weren't content to just observe their creation from a distance. They wanted more. The Anunnaki saw the beauty and potential in human women, and they started interbreeding with them. This wasn't a small affair, it was a full-on program. The offspring of these unions were the Nephilim, the hybrid giants with a mix of Anunnaki and human DNA. These beings weren't just taller and stronger, they were supernatural. They possessed knowledge, power, and abilities far beyond that of regular humans. They ruled over humanity, establishing themselves as kings and warriors, feared and revered in equal measure. Now, imagine what that would have looked like. Ancient humans, already seeing the Anunnaki as gods, now had to deal with the Nephilim, these giant, nearly invincible beings. Half god, half human. They would have been worshipped as rulers, and their dominance would have shaped the early civilizations that followed. In fact, many scholars believe that these stories of the Nephilim inspired the legends of demigods that we see in almost every ancient culture. Think of figures like Gilgamesh in Sumer, or even Hercules in Greek mythology, heroes who were part divine, part human, and wielded extraordinary power. But the rise of the Nephilim wasn't just about ruling kingdoms. It created a massive problem. The Bible talks about how the wickedness of these beings, along with humanity's corruption, brought divine judgment. That's where we get the story of the Great Flood. In Genesis, God sees the Nephilim and the chaos they've caused and decides to wipe out humanity, save for Noah and his family. But here's the twist, many believe that this wasn't just about punishing mankind, it was a way to purge the earth of these hybrids, these unnatural creations. You see, 
the flood wasn't just a biblical myth. Other cultures also have flood myths that tell similar stories, ancient gods destroying their creations because they got out of control. And the Sumerians, where the Anunnaki myths originate, have their own version of the flood. They speak of a time when the gods became fed up with humans, particularly with the Nephilim, and sent a great deluge to cleanse the earth. And this is where things get even more interesting. According to the book of Genesis, the Nephilim were on earth both before and after the flood. Meaning, some of them survived. Maybe they were able to escape the destruction, or maybe the Anunnaki had more control over the situation than the texts let on. Either way, these beings continued to influence early human civilization. Now, let's get one thing straight, when we talk about civilization, laws, agriculture, cities, writing, all the stuff we're told was part of the natural progression of human development, it didn't just pop out of nowhere. Ancient Sumeria wasn't some happy accident where humans just figured it all out on their own. The Anunnaki were directly involved in shaping these first kingdoms, and they had a very specific agenda. Once the Anunnaki had their workforce, that's us, and the Nephilim were running around as kings and warriors, it was time to organize everything. You see, the Anunnaki weren't just interested in gold, they needed to establish control over their creations. They set up what we now recognize as the Sumerian civilization, which, by the way, is considered the first known civilization on Earth. Coincidence? I don't think so. The Anunnaki didn't just give us basic tools and let us figure it out. No, they handed down advanced knowledge. Sumerians invented writing, astronomy, mathematics, law codes, and they built massive cities like Eridu, Uruk, and Nippur, cities that just appeared out of nowhere, fully formed and advanced. And guess who was credited with giving them this knowledge? You got it, the Anunnaki. They were seen as gods, ruling directly over these cities through their human kings and priests. Each major Sumerian city-state was ruled by a king who claimed to have a direct connection to the Anunnaki. These weren't just random human rulers, they were part of the divine system, basically acting as middlemen between the Anunnaki and the people. The Sumerian king lists even say that before the flood, kingship descended from heaven. So when we're talking about the divine rule, we're literally talking about the Anunnaki setting up the entire structure of government and religion. Let's take Eridu, the first city in Sumer. This wasn't just some primitive village. It was the cultural and religious heart of Sumeria, and its patron god? Enki, the same Anunnaki leader who created humanity in the first place. Eridu is where the Anunnaki established the first temples, the ziggurats, which were designed as literal platforms for the gods to come down from the heavens and communicate with the people. The priests in these temples weren't just performing rituals, they were the ones interpreting the will of the Anunnaki, making sure humanity stayed in line with their divine plan. And that's not all. The Anunnaki also introduced systems that kept humanity under their control, like law codes. You've probably heard of the Code of Hammurabi, but long before that, the Sumerians had law codes, including Yornamu's code, which were said to be given directly by the gods. The Anunnaki weren't just running the show in the background, they were actively shaping society, law, and morality to serve their interests. Now, this wasn't a benevolent arrangement. Sure, the Anunnaki gave humans advanced knowledge and civilization, but it wasn't free. There was a catch, they needed loyalty and obedience. The kings of Sumer weren't just political figures, they were divinely appointed overseers making sure humans towed the line. And when people didn't? Well, that's when the wrath of the gods came down, often in the form of wars, plagues, or even natural disasters. The Anunnaki weren't afraid to remind humans of who was really in charge. And let's not forget about the economy. The Anunnaki introduced concepts of tribute and offerings, think of it as the ancient version of taxes. But these weren't just about collecting wealth, it was a way to keep humanity dependent on their rulers, ensuring the flow of resources stayed in the hands of the elites, both human and Anunnaki. The temples became not just religious centers, but economic hubs, controlling the distribution of grain, livestock, and goods, everything that kept the society running. At the end of the day, Sumerian civilization wasn't just a spontaneous leap forward. 
It was orchestrated, a highly controlled system where the Anunnaki used their human kings and priests to enforce order. They gave just enough knowledge to keep humans productive, but never enough to make us question our place in the hierarchy. The Sumerians believed their rulers had divine authority because that's exactly what the Anunnaki wanted them to think. So, after centuries of living under the rule of the Anunnaki, working in their gold mines, building their cities, and following their orders, something inevitable happened. Humanity rebelled. And let's be real, it was bound to happen. You can only push people so far before they start questioning why they're being exploited, why they're living in a world built for the benefit of their so-called gods, and not for themselves. The Anunnaki had been using humans as their labor force, and over time, humanity had grown in number, intelligence, and, of course, dissatisfaction. The Sumerian texts describe a situation where the burden of work, constant toil in the fields, the endless cycle of giving tribute, became too much. We're talking about back-breaking labor, all to sustain the Anunnaki's greed and needs. At some point, the strain of it all pushed humans to the edge. And just like any oppressed group, they rose up. This wasn't just about physical rebellion, humans weren't exactly storming the Anunnaki palaces with pitchforks. Instead, the rebellion was about defiance. People started rejecting the rules, the systems the Anunnaki had put in place. The tribute stopped flowing, the temples were ignored, and society began to crumble. Humanity basically said, we're done. We've had enough. It's the oldest story in the book, the workers rise up against their masters. The Sumerian texts line up almost perfectly with the great flood story we see in the Bible. According to the myths, the rebellion threw the world into chaos, and the Anunnaki weren't happy about it. Enlil, one of the key Anunnaki leaders, had always viewed humans as little more than tools, and now they weren't even serving their purpose. Enlil's solution? Wipe them out. He decided that humanity had become too troublesome and ordered their destruction. And this is where we get the Flood. The Flood wasn't some natural disaster or divine punishment in the traditional sense, it was engineered. The Anunnaki had the power to control the elements, to unleash catastrophic floods, and they used that power to cleanse the earth. The goal? To reset the playing field, to wipe out the rebellious humans and start over. Think of it like hitting the reset button on a civilization that was no longer useful. But, and here's the important part, not all the Anunnaki agreed with this. Enki, who had always been more sympathetic toward humans, wasn't on board with wiping out his own creation. He had a different plan. In secret, Enki reached out to a human, Zeusudra in the Sumerian version, or as you know him in the Bible, Noah. He gave Noah the heads up, told him to build a boat, and to save his family and enough animals to repopulate the earth once the flood was over. So, we've got this massive, world-ending deluge, engineered by the gods, but with a small group of humans surviving thanks to Enki. And what's fascinating here is that the story of the Flood isn't just in the Bible or Sumerian texts, it shows up in cultures all over the world. From the Epic of Gilgamesh to the stories of ancient India, Greece, and even Native American legends, there's this common thread, a great Flood sent by the gods to cleanse the earth, but with a chosen survivor who rebuilds humanity afterward. Now, let's get real for a second. If the Flood really was an engineered event, if the Anunnaki really did unleash this on purpose, then we have to rethink the entire narrative of human survival. It wasn't some divine miracle, it was damage control. The Anunnaki wiped the slate clean, but only enough to keep humanity in check. Enki made sure some of us survived, not out of love for humans, but because he believed we still had a role to play in their grand plan. And after the waters receded, things didn't just go back to normal. The survivors, Noah, Zeusudra, whatever you want to call him, were tasked with rebuilding. They weren't free from the gods, they were given the knowledge and tools to restart civilization, but this time, under tighter control. The Anunnaki hadn't given up, they had simply reset the board. The cities, the temples, the systems of control. They all came back, more organized and more powerful than before. Humanity didn't escape their grip, we just entered into the next phase of their rule. Why did the Anunnaki leave Earth? After all, 
They created humanity, ruled over us, and shaped our entire civilization. So, why walk away from all of that? What made these ancient gods just pack up and leave? First off, this wasn't some sudden, out-of-the-blue disappearance. The Anunnaki didn't just vanish one day without a trace. Instead, their departure happened over time, almost like a planned exit. They weren't abandoning their creation, they were handing off control. And if you look closely at the ancient records, this wasn't about defeat or retreat, it was by design. Over the centuries, the Anunnaki slowly started to pull back from direct rule. You have to remember, they had already set up the infrastructure, human kings, priests, temples, law codes. They didn't need to be on the ground anymore. By this point, humanity was fully trained to follow their systems. The Anunnaki's job was done. They had created a world where humans were essentially self-managing under their rule, and they could now take a back seat. But why? Why leave at all? The answer might lie in their original mission. Remember, they came to Earth for gold, not to babysit humans forever. Once they had enough resources, once the mining operations had served their purpose, they no longer had a reason to stick around. Their home planet, Nibiru, was still out there, and if the mission was to stabilize their planet's atmosphere with Earth's gold, then maybe their work was complete. They didn't need Earth anymore. But here's the kicker, they didn't leave us with nothing. They left behind power structures, royalty, religion, the priesthood, that carried their influence. Think of it like this, the Anunnaki stepped back, but they didn't cut the strings. The puppet masters left the stage, but the puppets kept dancing. In fact, many ancient texts and myths suggest that the Anunnaki still watched from afar, occasionally intervening when things got out of hand. After their departure, the legends of the gods lingered. Human kings continued to claim divine right, saying they were chosen by the Anunnaki or were descendants of these gods. These royal bloodlines, whether in Sumer, Egypt, or even later in Europe, all trace their authority back to these divine rulers. The whole idea of divine kingship? Yeah, that's straight out of the Anunnaki playbook. And it's not just kings. Look at the priesthood. Temples didn't just go away. They became centers of power, controlling not only religion but the economy and the government. The priests were seen as the mouthpieces of the gods, keeping that divine connection alive. So, even though the Anunnaki weren't physically there anymore, their influence never left. They had set humanity on a course, and we were following it like clockwork. Now, let's talk about their return. Some ancient texts hint at the idea that the Anunnaki didn't leave forever. They were expected to come back. The Sumerians believed that their gods would return one day, and this belief carried over into other cultures as well. Look at the Mesoamerican legends of Quetzalcoatl or the Incan stories of Viracocha, both describe bearded, godlike figures who came from the sky and promised to return one day. These legends echo the idea of the Anunnaki's eventual return to Earth. But here's the question that really blows the doors open, did they ever leave at all? If the Anunnaki are real, advanced beings from another planet, they wouldn't have needed to be physically present to control humanity. Think about how we manage technology today, we can control entire factories, systems, and machines from across the globe. What if the Anunnaki simply shifted to a different form of control? What if they never left, but continued to influence humanity from the shadows, using intermediaries like rulers, secret societies, and elite bloodlines? Some theories suggest that the elites of today, the ones running governments, corporations, and global institutions, are part of this ancient power structure that traces back to the Anunnaki. The symbols, the rituals, the obsession with gold, power, and control, it all mirrors the systems the Anunnaki put in place thousands of years ago. Could these powerful families and groups be the modern-day proxies of the Anunnaki, ensuring that the world continues to function according to the plan they laid out millennia ago? And let's not forget one more crucial thing, technology. Many people believe that the rapid advancements we've seen in technology, especially in the last century, aren't just the result of human ingenuity. Some believe that this knowledge was given to us, or at least inspired, by the same beings who gave the Sumerians writing and astronomy.
When the Anunnaki left, or at least, when they stopped physically ruling over humanity, they didn't just abandon us. They left behind a system. A system that's been in place for thousands of years, shaping everything from our governments to our religions, and even our economy. Think about it, the obsession with power, hierarchy, control, and, most importantly, gold. Gold has always been a symbol of wealth and status, but for the Anunnaki, it was much more. It was the reason they came here in the first place. And to this day, gold continues to be one of the most valuable commodities on Earth. Coincidence? Probably not. But let's talk about the deeper influence. The elites, the powerful families, the ruling dynasties, the secret societies that seem to run everything behind the scenes, where did they come from? Some researchers believe that the ancient bloodlines of kings and rulers, especially those who claim divine right, are directly tied to the Nephilim and the Anunnaki. These elite bloodlines have carried on the legacy, controlling the masses through economic and political systems that keep us at the bottom and them at the top. And this isn't just some wild conspiracy theory. The symbolism is everywhere. The all-seeing eye, the pyramid, the sun worship, these are symbols that trace back to ancient times, to the Anunnaki and their influence over humanity. Even the very idea of worshipping gods who demand obedience and tribute, that's something the Anunnaki instilled in humanity. And let's not forget how modern-day religions have maintained many of the same structures the Anunnaki put in place. The concept of powerful beings ruling from above, dictating our lives, demanding loyalty, these are echoes of the Anunnaki's rule. But let's take this even further. What if the rapid advancements we've seen in technology, science, and society are not just the result of human ingenuity? What if they're the result of knowledge passed down from the Anunnaki, or even given directly to certain groups? Some believe that the Anunnaki, or beings like them, are still guiding humanity's progress, pushing us toward a future that benefits them as much as it benefits us. And when you think about it, the speed of technological advancement in just the last century is staggering. Could we be living through the final phase of the Anunnaki's plan? It makes you wonder, are we still serving them without even realizing it? From our obsession with wealth and power to the systems that keep the world divided and unequal, it's hard not to see the hand of something much bigger than us at play. Maybe we never really stop being the labor force they created us to be. Maybe the only difference is that now, the control is more subtle, hidden beneath layers of society that we take for granted as just the way things are. The Bible talks about powerful rulers, false gods, and the dangers of serving two masters. In Matthew 6 verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Think about that in the context of everything we've discussed. Are we still serving the same false gods, obsessed with wealth and power, without realizing it? The legacy of the Anunnaki isn't just ancient history, it's alive and well in the structures that control our world today. And whether you believe they're still watching, still guiding, or have completely stepped away, one thing's for sure, their influence hasn't left us. The systems they built, the hierarchies they established, they are still in place. And maybe, just maybe, it's time we start questioning who we're really serving. So, as we wrap this up, we want to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And as always, God bless us all.